Well, this is our final session in the Vertical Church series, and uh, we come now to the most important matter. I understand that in some things that you study, maybe the last material is throwaway material to reach some a magic number of sessions, not the case in Vertical Church. We've saved the best, uh, the most important, the uh, critical uh, to the very end. The title of this session is Unceasing Prayer. And the story of my life, the story of our church, the story of any vertical church is a story of increasing capacity to call upon the God who said, Jeremiah 33, 3, God says, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you did not know. Now, if you've been longing to know more of God's manifest presence in your church, I can assure you that it's not coming apart from growth in prayer. In fact, I would suggest that uh, the story of our church experience, our pursuit of earth-shattering, window-rattling, life-altering, uh, manifest presence church is really the story of our growth in prayer. I think back to the very beginning when we had early morning prayer meetings uh, several times a week up before anyone else, 5, 6 a.m., uh, kneeling in a quiet room, calling out to God to manifest His presence in our church, to save people, to show up in power. And I don't mean kind of weak, sort of soft praying. I'm talking about fervent, earnest prayer that the Scripture tells us affects much. Do you pray like that? I know that I didn't, but I had to learn to. I remember um, early in the life of our church, we thought the whole church was going to come apart. A couple of hundred people had left. I had just one associate pastor, and I'll never forget kneeling with him together and committing to just two more years uh, if God would hold it together. Well, of course, he did more than that, but I really look back to those critical prayers and how God answered. When we wanted to get out of our high school and get into a permanent facility, we needed three hundred thousand dollars and given from our people in just six weeks it seemed insurmountable God brought in almost four hundred thousand I believe in response to our prayers that was the first time I had ever prostrated myself and laid out before the Lord uh, calling out to him incredible answers to prayer is the story of a vertical church and growing in that capacity to pray those kind of prayers and believe God for those kind of answers. If you really want to be part of a vertical church, you're gonna to have to do what we call praying the price. And this session is about how to do that. Let me say it in a sentence for you. Fervent, faith-filled, persistent prayer is a prerequisite to God's manifest presence if you wanna be part of a vertical church. Let's get into this together. This is an incredible a portion of God's Word. Uh, Jeremiah 33, 3, let me read, uh, please, every eye on God's Word now. Let me read from verse uh, 1. The Word of the Lord came to Jeremiah a second time while he was still shut up in the court of the guard. Thus says the Lord who made the earth, the Lord who formed it to establish it, the Lord is his name, Call to me, and I will answer you, and will tell you great and hidden things that you uh, have not known. Now, four uh, words package uh, this power for us uh, today. Here's the first one, uh, invitation. Invitation. Look at the text yourself. Imagine that you had to get this message ready. And let me just ask you, can you see the invitation in the text? Uh, God himself uh, is giving an invitation here. Um, notice who is speaking. I'm not uh, uh, always the quickest as I would like to be in, in my study, but when the text says, thus says the Lord, capital O-R-D, who made the earth, the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, who formed it to establish it, the Lord is his name. How many people could have figured out there was something getting emphasized there? Who's talking? Who's talking? Lift up your voice. Say it together. Who's talking? The, Lord. the Lord's talking. And we've learned in uh, many other messages that when we see L-O-R-D capitalized in our Bibles, that is God's personal covenant name. Okay? 
That's God making now, that's God making a covenant commitment to you. If you have turned from your sin and embraced Jesus Christ by faith for your forgiveness, God has made a covenant with you. He has said, look at, I have swore, he says, by my own name. God has promised to do some things for you. Now, it doesn't matter what you've done. Amen? Amen. God has made some commitments regardless of what you've done. How many people have done some things that they regret? All right? And the enemy would say to you, because of what you did, it's over with you and God. But God says, I am the Lord. I have made a covenant with you. Okay? He's made a covenant with us. This is an awesome promise. And when God reveals himself this way, 6,823 times in the Old Testament, God's invitation is for us to know him personally. It's his name, Yahweh, is the best translation of that. God reveals to us his personal name. He didn't give us a title, the most common reference to God in the Old Testament, capital L-O-R-D, Yahweh. I want relationship with you. And so this one who invites us to prayer, again, Jeremiah 33, 2, thus says Yahweh who made the earth, Yahweh who formed it to establish it, Yahweh the Lord is his name. Now, in the matter of invitations to assist, uh, the critical point, I think you'd agree, in the matter of invitations to, to uh, assist, uh, what really matters is who's, invite, who's, who's offering. Would you agree? Yeah. And if I were to say to you, for example, I hear that, uh, I hear that your uh, daughter is uh, struggling with uh, her math, and uh, I'd like to help her. And well, Pastor Dave, I've been coming to Harvest for a while, and I, I believe I've heard you reference in several messages that you failed high school math not several, but many times. <laughs> yeah, so um, we love you, Pastor James, but we don't really want, you can help us with some stuff, but please, please do not talk to any of my children about their math ever. <laughs> right? If, if I came to you and I said to you, um, listen, I hear you're having some medical problems, and you may have heard that I'm a doctor. <laughs> and uh, Kathy and I have been a little short lately. I would like to offer to do any surgery for $19.95. <laughs> I will do any surgery. You can come to my house. How many people would not want that? Listen to me. Who, who is making the offer is everything. In the matter of offers to assist, who is offering to assist is everything. And so I draw your attention back to the text, verse 2. Thus says, tell me, the Lord who made the earth. Who, who, who's, who's inviting me to prayer? The Lord who formed it to establish it. The Lord is his name. If you had never known this, and you had come to church today, and you had never known this, and I told you for the first time, you can talk to the creator of the universe and he will listen to you and he wants you to you would all be like ah, I gotta go right now it's the familiarity that breeds the contempt it's the commonness that produces the disdain the offer is staggering call to me it says notice to me. God is being very specific with us. Don't call your mother or your brother or your boss or your friend. Not first. Not fastest. Not foremost. Call me, God says. Call me. How often we run to our spouse with a kid problem when we should run to God. How often we run to our boss with a work problem when we should run to God, how often we run to a friend with a relationship problem when we should run, tell me, who says, call to me. How many words do you speak in a day? Do you know? The average person speaks 
34,000 words a day. The average woman, no, I'm just, <laughs> just totally kidding, relax. Send your letters to Pastor Rick. <laughs> the average person speaks 34,000 words in a day. That's half a book. Talk, 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 before your feet are on the floor. Talk, 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 talk. The average you say, I haven't read a book in like six months. No, but you talk a half of one every day. <laughs> every single day. Question, question. Loved ones, if we're all talking a half a book a day, how many of those words? Is there even a page for God? A couple of pages? When was the last time you gave half a chapter to God in a single day who says, call to me? Now, notice the word call. Call. That's an invitation to intensity. God invites us not to whimper to him. Not to whisper to him. Not to speak or even to... God's not say things to me. How do you want us to talk to you, God? I want you to call. That's an expression of urgency, intensity, fervency. God says, call to me. And if... Uh, there was a particular time that we should call, though we should call all the time. Would you agree? Yes. We should call all the time, but uh, to look in the text, don't miss verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, a s glory coming down here, a second time. When did it come? End of verse 1. While he was shut up in the, he was in prison. He was in prison. Sometimes we find ourselves in some kind of a prison. I'm locked in. I can't get out of this situation with my job, with my health, with my family. I feel like I am locked in right now. What? What should I do? God, God tells you, hey, Jeremiah, how's it going for you today? I'm not great. I'm in prison for you. What do you want me to do now? Call to me. Call to me. Now listen, loved ones, this, this calling is, is a really big deal. When does a child call out? When they're fearful in the night and they need a parent. They don't whisper. They call out. When a child is lost and alone, and need some direction, they call out when they're hurt. They, have been a, they need a parent to help them or to heal them. They call out. Most of the prayers in this room offered this week were offered in a way that if someone were beside you, they would have not heard you. And it's not wrong to think our prayers to God, and he can hear those. But that's not what the Scripture tells us. The Scripture tells us not to think our prayers, not to whisper our prayers, not to even speak our prayers, but we are to call out. And if there's something lacking in our prayers, it may be the fervency that is born of volume. Okay? Now, you, in the way that God wired you, just like we talked about in worship, you may not be capable of the same volume that I am. Sometimes when you preach, they laugh at unintended moments. <laughs> you may not be capable of the same volume that I am, but I love the way you are. And more importantly, God loves the way you are. And all that he's asking is that you max out your dial. Okay? Could you just turn it up to full, please, and show me how serious you are about this thing that you're praying about. Now, I'm telling you, loved ones, there is something very powerful in what I'm talking to you about. And if you've never got alone, don't let anyone be in your house. Don't let anyone be near you or you'll be conscious about it. I've never told anyone about this. My wife doesn't know about this. This is the, this is my prayer carpet from my house. 
I had it picked up today. She said, what are you doing with that? Because she doesn't know about it. This is the place where I have laid out before the Lord and cried out to God in prayer. And I have never prayed like that. Listen to me. I have never prayed like that and been ultimately disappointed. Sometimes it was weeks, sometimes it was months, a couple times it was years. But I have never gone after God like that on this right here. I have wet this carpet with my tears and cried out to God in prayer. Now look, at I'm not making this up. This is God's word. And when he says, call to me, he's not saying whisper something, think a couple of thoughts, throw it over your shoulder while you're on your way to the grocery store. This is in, James 5 says, the fervent prayer of a righteous man results in much. And there's something that happens in the heart of God when his children get themselves out on a limb and gather up their heart and say, God, if it's not you, it's nothing now. I don't have another plan. I don't have another hope. All my eggs are in your basket. Let's do this, God, in your time, in your way. And you lay that down before the Lord. And that is an awesome, awesome thing. If you don't know what I'm talking about, then you might be what James is talking about when he says, you have not because you ask not. This is what asking is. There's a fervency that builds faith in your heart. What an invitation. What an invitation. Isaiah 49 says, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up and do not be afraid. Psalm 116, 1, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice. Romans 8, 15, you have received the spirit by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Psalm 50, 15, call upon me in the day of trouble and I will answer you. See, that's the key, isn't it? And that gets us to our second word. Invitation. Call to me. You're like, James, I, that's great for you. But I just, I'm just afraid if I get out on a limb like that, if I let my heart really want what God wants and it doesn't happen, what am I going to be left with then? If you're playing it safe, if you're playing maybe God doesn't want it, Maybe I won't ask for it. I could get real disappointed. But aren't you disappointed now? Notice this incredible statement. Call to me. What's the next phrase? And I will answer you. Call to me and I will answer you. Write this down. This is insurance. Insurance. And why will God answer me? Because he's able. He actually can. How many parents here have ever broken promises to their kids? Anybody ever broken promises? Or broken promises to your kids, right? And, and what, what was it? Was it that you didn't want to or was it, see what happens to me sometimes, uh, especially when our kids were younger, is I would tell them I'll do something and I really meant to do it and I wanted to do it. But something happened, something changed and I just wasn't, what wasn't I? Wasn't able to do it. How often does that happen to God? Yeah, we kind of overcommitted there. Sorry, you know, we've got a lot of people asking for contentment right now. We're getting really short on that, right? God doesn't, God's not able to lie, and he doesn't lack ability. God does what he desires. Jot this reference down, Isaiah 46, 11. Truly I have spoken. Truly I will bring it to pass. I have planned it. Surely I will do it. Wow. And God says that because God is able. He can't lie and he can do it. Now, you say, well, James, I got to tell you, I've prayed a lot of different things and, and God didn't answer. Is that true? I believe that God answers every prayer. Many of you know this. What are the answers that God gives to prayer? First one. First one is, yes. That's the most often answer you get to prayer, provided you're not praying for stupid stuff. Okay? If you're praying for stupid stuff, you could wait a long time uh, for a yes. And, and, uh, but if you're, like, let me give you some prayers that I've always, I, 
I have never asked for strength and not received it. Never. And I have to pray for strength a lot, and other people pray for my strength too. And I believe that I have been and am receiving that. I have never, ever prayed for wisdom and not received it. I've never prayed and asked for peace. God, I'm anxious. My heart's like a furnace right now. Could you give me peace in this storm? I know you might not take away the storm right now, God, but could you give me peace right now? I'll just lay this burden. I have never knelt down and given my burdens to God and asked for peace and not received it. So let's put this in the category where it really is. Most biblical praying receives an immediate what? Yes. Uh, second answer to prayer, uh, very uncommon, uh, is the answer no. That's why James says you have not because you ask not, or you have not because you ask amiss. The only time you get a no is if you pray for stupid stuff, or if you pray for good stuff but you, you put a timeline on it. I have found God very unresponsive to my ultimatums. <laughs> How about you? I got to have this, God. I got to have it by Friday. I, I have never, I, I doubt if they're hardly ever up in heaven. Oh, he's going to quit. We better do that. Okay? And God doesn't respond to that. So if I'm praying foolishly, I'll get a no. But if I'm praying according to God's will, and I'm willing to, this is the third answer. Yes, no, and what's the third one? Wait, wait, you got to wait. Yes. The answer is yes. The only thing between you and that is time. And, and uh, there's a lot of things like that. But I wonder if we don't forfeit our yes through doubt. God has made promises about us. God has made promises about our family. You getting that? God's made promises about um, unsaved loved ones that we have. God's made promises about a lot of stuff. And look, if, if, whatever you ask in faith, believe that you have received it. Believe that you have received it. My son's already come home. I already have a job. I, I already have uh, whatever I have biblically asked the Lord for. Whatever you ask in faith, believe that you have received it, and it will be, not it is done for you, but it will be done for you. It's just a matter of time. I believe that when we get to heaven, we're going to see by far that there is so much that we have forfeited. Oh, what needless pain we bear, the hymn said. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Insurance. The insurance. I will answer you. Inspiration is next. Inspiration. Call to me and I will answer you. What's the answer going to be like, God? What's it going to be like when you answer me? Well, it's going to be like two things. First of all, I will tell you great things you have not known. Let's just talk about Jeremiah here for a minute. Jeremiah was from Anathoth. Uh, today it's called Anata, three miles northeast of Jerusalem. He was unmarried. It is a sign of the harsh judgment that God was bringing to correct Israel and their rebellion. They were into idol worship. They were into deception and idolatry and tyranny. They had, you, you say, man, it's so hard now. I wish we could go back to the old days. Really? How about these days when uh, the people were so far from God that they were taking their little children and burning them in the fire and offering them to Molech? God's people were doing this. They were, don't ever say to yourself, it's so far gone, it's never coming back. And so for five decades, Jeremiah ministered from 627 beyond the Babylonian captivity to about 570 B.C., He's called the weeping prophet. He saw no revival, uh, no converts to speak of. At the time of Jeremiah 33.3, he was in prison, as I said, no doubt perplexed, confused. Here it is, unable to understand why God had allowed what he'd allowed. Now, I just can't make it any clearer to you than this. If you're here today and something is going on in your life and you're drawing a dotted line to God and saying, if God really is, then why X? The answer to that is prayer. Okay. 
God says, call to me in that moment, and I will tell you great things you don't know. Here's an awesome thing to pray about. It doesn't matter if you're going through a heartbreak in ministry or in your family or in your career or wherever it showed up. That is prime time to go to God and say, I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing it. Why would you allow us to go through this? Now, that answer is not necessarily coming from Scripture. I can't take you to a passage to tell you it's coming from a friend. But insight to help you understand what's happening and why comes through prayer. And the reason why we're so often perplexed and frustrated and bitter and defeated, God forgive us, is because of our prayerlessness. Call to me, and I will tell you great things you have not known. Jot these three uh, enemies of, these are the big three enemies of prayer in my life. Things that keep me from praying. Number one, anger. When I'm angry, I don't pray. Or maybe I'm angry because I what? didn't pray. Anger is, this shouldn't be like this. I don't accept this situation. I'm not good with this. And anger is, it can be a righteous, but often it's an unrighteous response to circumstance. Fear. Fear. Will God really come through? Is he trustworthy? Is, is this really going to work out? I can't see it. I'm afraid it isn't. I want to believe it is, but I'm afraid it never will be. And so I don't pray. And I'm afraid. Anger, fear, doubt. Less so for me after many years, but at times past and certainly possible. And I think many of you, is God really good? Is he really listening? Is this really real? And I remember those days very vividly, and, and we're all prone at various times to have doubts. It's such an enemy of prayer. Into each of these dark nights of the soul, anger, fear, and doubt, God lovingly steps with inspiration to tell us things that we have not known. Now, everyone look up here for a minute, and I'm just going to, by faith, imagine all the people on the other campuses listening to me too. Let me just say this, what great perplexity is anchoring your soul that God would answer you through prayer? What is it? What is it? What great perplexity anchors your soul because you have not heard the great hidden thing? Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great things you have not known. And you sit here today, and you don't know what it is. You don't know the great thing because you haven't called out to him. I know it's true because I was that person. There are many people here who have never really knelt down and prayed out loud. There are many people here who have never prostrated themselves before the Lord. Never, not one time. But you've had things that should have pushed you to that, but you went in a different direction. There are many people listening right now who have never raised their voice and cried out to God in prayer. Your score in that category would be zero. And do I say that to shame you? Do I? Why do I say it? to encourage you, to motivate you, to cause you to see that this great, vast field of harvest lies before you and you skirt around its provision. When you should walk out into that field and make yourself hoarse and spend your strength in prayer and watch God do something awesome and tell you something great that you have not known. And then, I love this, illumination. Great things may be things that other people see, but I can't see it. 
Illumination are things that no one can see but me and God. Notice there, hidden things. Some translations have mighty things. NIV says unsearchable things. The Hebrew term is used of fortified cities that were inaccessible and unassailable. God knows things about our circumstances. Great things, mighty things, hidden things. This is one of the greatest blessings of prayer. God tells us things. Go to God about that person. God tells us why people are the way they are. God tells us why certain things had to happen as they did. God tells us what good is being accomplished that we can't see. God tells us how the future will be better, even though it seems impossible now. Hidden things. Can't you be more specific? No, I cannot, because I don't know what they are. Isn't it awesome to think that God has some hidden things for you? Don't you want the hidden things? Some, what, how awesome to know something that only you and God know. You found it out in prayer. And he gave it to your heart, and it made all the difference. Call to me, and I will answer you. And will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. You don't learn those things in college. You learn them through prayer. You don't learn those things in small group or even at church. You learn them in prayer. You don't learn these things in books from your favorite Bible teacher or scholar. You don't even learn these things in experience or through time. You learn them in prayer. What do I not know that I could know if I was more faithful in prayer? Now listen, loved ones. This is the great secret of whatever God is doing here at our church. This has been a church of praying people, and it must always be so. I can think of times when this whole room was filled with people calling out to God. I can't even count the times that's happened here. Hours and hours of prayer. I could take you back into the room over here where Kathy and I came so many times at 3 o'clock or 2 o'clock in the morning and met in a circle of people and called out to God for our church and for so many of you that we didn't even know uh, at the time. So many times and in so many places, in our small groups, all over uh, this great city, people calling out to God in prayer. Now, we will never exceed our prayer cover as a church. Prayer is what brings the glory down. If we want God to show up at church and save our family and reach our neighbors and heal our bodies and restore our marriages, we have to ask him. Nothing, nothing will substitute for that. You can't fake it. You can't phone it in. You can't delegate it to somebody else. We must be a praying people.